So for the last few weeks, we've been on this journey through the book of Ephesians. And what we've learned, what we've been taught is that Ephesians can be broken up into two sections. Right? The first three chapters are all about salvation. Right? What Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and what that means for us. And the last three chapters, which is part of today's message, is what do we do in light of what Jesus Christ has done? Right? How are we to live? Last week, Pastor Josh, he taught us that God is calling us out of worldliness and into new life with him. And how does that happen? It's by imitating Jesus Christ. Right? He said, we are an epic trailer to an epic movie, but nobody's going to want to watch the movie if the trailer stinks. And so in that same way, as we imitate Jesus Christ, that also means that he has authority over every part of our lives, including our relationships. So today, we're going to be looking at what it means to make Jesus Christ the Lord over our relationships. Right, a phrase that I think we, a lot of times we like to throw around in the church is, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. But what does that actually mean? What does it mean that Jesus Christ is the Lord over your life? Right, to make something Lord over your life means that you will submit to their authority and will in your life. And so when we say Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life, it's saying, Jesus, I give you full authority, full access over my life, and I will be obedient to your will. It's elevating Jesus to this highest place where everything else falls under it. It means that we will be obedient to God, knowing that his plans, his purposes, his goals for us are the best. And so making Jesus the Lord over our lives means that he dictates and shapes every single part of our lives. And that includes our treasures, our times, but also our relationships. And this is why it's so important. The reason why making Jesus Christ the Lord over our relationships is so important is because the health of our relationships depend on it. If Jesus isn't the Lord over your relationships, then your relationships are doomed to fail. If he isn't the Lord over your relationships, the alternative is that you are the Lord of your relationships and everything is about you. And when it's all about ourselves and how people can serve us and fulfill our needs, our relationships will deteriorate because people will feel used and abused. They'll grow bitter and angry. Right? Think about when was the last time you enjoyed being with somebody or talking to someone who is all, who's only talking about themselves. Right? If any of you guys have gone on a first date and that person only spoke about themselves, how many of you guys would actually want a second date? When relationships are about ourselves, they die. For relationships to thrive, you need to get over yourself. Not everything has to be about you. And God wants us to live in community. He wants us to have relationship, but not any kind of relationship. The relationships that he has for us are life-giving relationships. And so we're going to learn how do, we, how do we actually live into this? How do we live as Jesus Christ is the Lord over our relationships? And we're going to look at Ephesians 5.21 to discover that. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And I'm going to just preface it. It's a little bit long today's passage. Uh, but the reason why I want to read it together is because all three of these relationships that we'll encounter... Right, go side and side, or go coincide with each other. Right? There's, a, there's a major central theme in it, so we're going to read through all these relationships. So starting with verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives sh should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united with, to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, 
Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you are serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Right. Did anyone struggle reading this? Right. For the last few weeks, as I've been preparing this sermon, I had to wrestle with this text. The text, it sounds so oppressive and so hateful, and it seems to go against everything that I know about God and the gospel. Right? I know that God is a God of love, of justice, of freedom, and yet here, it seems like the opposite. Right? As, I was think, as I was reading these words, I was thinking, surely, God, this is not what you would want. This is one of the passages which I think many Christians just hoped or wish weren't there. And the reason why is because many people have used these texts to oppress and hurt others. They've taken this text and used it for their own agenda. Right? Men have used this to oppress women. Parents have used this to oppress their children. And even some people have used this to legitimize slavery. And that breaks my heart. And so if you've been hurt by these words, if people have used these words on you, I want to just say I'm sorry. I apologize on behalf of the church. I'm sorry for letting the church use these words to hurt you. But I also ask that you don't check out right now. Because these words weren't meant to hurt you or oppress you. These words were meant to give life. And so why does Paul write these words? Right? He's not condoning the oppression of women. He's not condoning the oppression of children. He's not legitimizing slavery. What Paul is doing here is confronting the circumstances of his time and showing and revealing how the gospel transforms every situation. He's not asking for the restructuring of society. He's asking for the restructuring of our relationships because Paul understands that the injustices that he sees is caused by the devaluing and dehumanizing of people. Paul is writing these words in order to instruct the church in how the gospel reorients and reshapes our relationships. In those days, Christians were accused of destroying their society because they were so focused on freedom, love, and following Christ. Non-Christians, they needed to know that this was not the case, that Christians weren't there to destroy society. And so Paul here teaches the relevance of their faith, the relevance of Christians' faith in their relationships. And so that's why he's addressing marriage, parenting, and slavery. For Paul, the greatest discipleship tool in life is people. Right? People are the context in which we live out our faith. And if we're honest, those who, are weak, those who we are closest to will, will reveal who we truly are. Right? A lot of times we have this public life and this, uh, this private life. But it's in our private life. It's the ones who we care about, the ones that we are closest with, who will reveal who we truly are. And so this passage is not so much about marriage or parenting or slavery as much as, as it is about mutual submission. Right? The underlying instruction here is for all of us to submit to one another. In verse 21, Paul says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right? This is what it means to make Jesus the Lord over your relationship. These instructions aren't for a certain type of people. It's not for a certain group of people. It's not for the married. It's not for the single. It's not for the parent or child. It's for all of us who know and love Jesus Christ and proclaim him as our Lord. We are all called to submit to one another. So what does submission look like? Right? What does it mean to submit? Submission is nothing more than a decision about the relative worth of others. 
is voluntarily giving up our rights, our desires, our interests, not because the other person is more important than us, but simply because the other person is valuable and has worth. Right? It doesn't mean you have to be a doormat and let them walk all over you, but it's declaring that this other person matters. You submit not because they are more important, but simply because they are important. It's a decision that people are worthy and valuable, not because of anything they do for you, but because God has said so. It's saying that we do not judge a person's worth based on the world's standards, but by God's standards. And what is God's standards? Jesus Christ did not die for one of you. He died for all of us, which means that we are equal. We are worthy, we are valuable and precious because Jesus Christ has deemed so. Our society is full of dysfunctional relationships because we can't submit. Right? We always look at submission as, is, as if it was a negative thing. We look at submission and think it's losing. But submission is not losing. Losing means that you got beat, that somebody is better than you. Submission is voluntarily, willingly giving up your needs, your rights, your interests to benefit the other. Submission is winning because when mutual submission happens, everyone is better for it. When you can empower someone else, good things will happen. Right? The beautiful thing about mutual submission is that when everyone is doing it, nobody's being left behind. Everyone's needs are taken care of. So then why is submission so hard for us? Right? I believe the biggest reason why submission is so hard is that it's so unnatural. What is natural for us is to be self-centered. We think about our needs, our circumstances, and our feelings. It's about our sinful nature and our pride that, allows, that makes us think of ourselves first. Right? It's natural to look at a person and see how this person should fulfill my needs. And we do that without thinking. Right? I really don't believe that we go and look at people and say, how can I use this person today? But it's our pride. It's our self-centeredness. And this is why we can't do it on our own power. Submission is only possible when we are filled with the Spirit. Right? In a few verses before what we just read and what Pastor Josh read last week, right, it says that we are filled with the Spirit and the mark of a person who is filled with the Spirit, not only will they walk away from worldliness and imitate Christ, but it's also they will be willing to submit. It's only in our relationship with Christ that we are willingly, that we willingly submit. Without a deep relationship with Jesus, we will never be able to submit because naturally it will always be about us. And not only so, it's not only is it our self-centeredness, but even our culture breathes this. Right? The whole premise of the American dream is, is about individuality. It's about we are taught that freedom and individuality are the highest pursuits in life. And if you work hard enough, you can accomplish anything. And depending on what you accomplish and depending on how successful you are, that's your worth. And with the same eyes, we look at everyone else. We look at what have you done, what have you accomplished, and we base a worth depending on that. But what God tells us here is that we are beautiful, valuable, and worthy, not because of anything that we do, but because of who God is. This is why we can't do anything to love, to do, to, for God to love us more or less. His love for us is perfect already. He loves us despite our junk. He loves us despite our sin. He loves us not because of what we do, but who we are. In the same way, we are to treat others. Submission out of reverence for Christ requires us to place Christ above ourselves. It's about valuing and treating people not for what they do for us, but how Jesus Christ values them. And we look at the cross and we see that Jesus Christ has said each and every one of us is beautiful, worthy, and redeemed. Submission is the decision to value others as God values them. And so what does that actually look like in real life? And what does it look like to submit here, Paul gives us a picture of three distinct relationships of what it means to submit. The first is marriage, the second is parenting, and the third is our, in our work relationships. But in all three relationships, God calls us to submit to one another. And so why these three? All right, the reason why I believe that Paul is, is specifically pointing out these three relationships is because these are the most influential relationships in your life. 
Only so because this is where, you're, where your time is dominated. Usually you're with your family, whether you're with your child or your spouse, or you're at work working with the, your employees and employers. And so I believe that's why he, he looks at these three specific uh, relationships and asks us to submit to them. So the first, what does it mean to submit in marriage? What, is it to act, what does it actually look like to submit in our marriages? Right? In marriage, submission is giving up your need to be served. Giving up your need to be served. When we're single and dating, we're looking for that perfect person who will fulfill all of our needs. And that's why we make up lists. Right? I'll, I'll admit, I'll be honest, I'll come forward. I, I made a list of my future spouse. <laughs> right? But we make up lists because we have all these things that we want them to fulfill in us. Or we want them to complete in us. And so we make up these lists and we try to find that person who's going to check out all the boxes. And once we do, then we're ready to settle down. Then we're ready to get married. But within the marriage, marriage relationship, those needs just get magnified. Now that you're committed to each other, now you, de- you think that they, you deserve them, uh, for them to serve you. And so in marriage, those needs just get more and more magnified. But here, Paul flips the script. He says in verse 21, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. For those of you who have used this verse on your wife, you have no idea what you're asking for. Right? If you truly understood what, you were, uh, what Paul is saying here, husbands, if you're asking your wives to submit to you, then you better be ready to take responsibility for them, even to the point of dying. Because that is what Paul's asking. Are you ready to die for your wife? Paul's instructions to wives to submit to their husbands isn't because they're inferior or any less. But he's saying submit so that you can show your husband the love of Christ. When Paul says that husbands are the head, he isn't saying that women are inferior, but he's telling husbands, take responsibility for the well-being of your wife. Paul is redefining what it means to be the head. He's not saying that the husband is above the wife, but the husband is to be responsible in loving, nurturing, and caring for his wife. Because in those times, in Paul's times, women had no rights. The submission that Paul is calling wives to isn't one out of obligation. In those days, women were obligated to submit to their husbands. But Paul is saying, no, you don't submit out of obligation anymore. In light of what Jesus Christ has done, you have value. You have rights. You have freedom. And so you no longer submit because you were obligated to, but you submit so that you can show your husband the love of Christ. It's when, we, it's when wives, you submit to your husbands, do you show them not only who Christ is, but you also show them what it means to trust and respect them. Right? Husbands never experience Jesus more than when a wife can imitate Jesus in self-sacrifice. When you submit to your husbands, you show them and remind them that they are trustworthy, that they are respect, respectable. And that's all your husband wants, to know that you respect them. Right, there was a study done in 2006 where they were trying to figure out what do men and women long for the most. And what they discovered was that men, what they long for the most is to be respected. Right, that's what we want as men most. And for women, it was to be loved. And this is not new to God. Right, if you look at what it says in verse 33 in the passage, Paul says, However, each one of you, husbands, must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. What husbands need most is to be respected, and the way husbands know they are respected is to know that you trust them. When you submit to your husbands, you reveal Christ, but you also show them their beauty. While men want to be respected, women want to be loved. And so, husbands, it is our job to love our wives. Paul's instructions for husbands in verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right? How did Christ love the church? He gave up his life for the church. He died on the cross for the church. Are you ready to die to yourself in order to elevate your wife? 
Loving your wife isn't about feelings. It's not about how you feel at the moment. It's about making the decision to give up your needs and to deny yourself so that you can empower your wife. But Paul continues. In verse 26, he says, uh, To love is to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing, of, washing with water through the word, and to present, her, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Husbands, you are to love your wives to the point of showing how lovely and beautiful they are. Just as Christ shows that the church is radiant, it is our job to show that our wives are radiant. And that can only happen through sacrificial love. It requires us to give up our need to be served and instead to love. We know the extent of love by how much is sacrificed. We see that Jesus loved us by him giving up his life for us. What will reveal how beautiful your wife is, is your willingness to sacrifice for them. Right? For instance, if I wanted to show my wife, Esther, how much I loved her, I would want to do something nice. And so what if I were to go into a flower shop, look at all the flowers, pick out the most beautiful flower, pay for it, and then give it to her? Or what if instead I saw a rose patch, I jumped in, and I started digging for the most beautiful flower to pick out for her. And I, I come out with all these scars and the, all these scratches. And I'm, I go, here, hon, right, I picked out this rose for you. Which would express my love for her more? What's easy is to go into a flower shop and give her flowers. What's hard is to sacrifice myself in showing how much I love her. What makes Jesus' love for, for us so apparent are the scars that he bore and the death that he experienced. It was his nail-pierced hands and his feet. It was his scars on his brow. It was the life that he gave up so that we could have life. It was his scars that stand as a proof of his love for us. Yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again three days, and we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. We celebrate his power over death and sin. But it's his scars that remind us of how much he loves us. In loving our wives well, we need to learn what it means to be intimate. Right? Men struggle with intimacy. We think that intimacy is all about sex. But true intimacy is your ability to deny yourself in order to remind your wives how beautiful and lovely they are every single day. Right? What wives want most is connection. What they want is to know that you love them and care for them and that you have them in mind. We need to learn how to love our wives in a way where they feel loved and cared for. Right? How we express love may be very different from how we experience love. Right? We all have different love languages, and typically we like to express our love in the way that is easiest for us. But in doing so, are our spouses not getting the picture? We need to surrender what is easy in order to love well, right? And Esther, my wife, she's excellent at this. And probably the best picture of it is when we get sick, right? When, we get to, when I get sick, Esther will drop everything to serve me, right? Esther will drop uh, doing her work, doing everything else. She'll, she'll cook for me. She'll take care of me. She'll make sure that I'm on the bed comfortable, make sure that our, our blanket is over me. She allows me just to watch and rest. And she's there just to be by my side, you know, rub my belly or whatever else it is. <laughs> But for me, I'm terrible at it. I'll be quite honest. Like, I am so bad that Esther in the past has said, uh, Clay, you suck at loving me. <laughs> and so it's only through the years that I've learned what that meant. Um, but the reason why is because for me, I'm a fixer. So I look at a problem, I look at an issue, and I'm like, what is the most logical step? Right? What, is, what do I need to do to fix this problem? And so in that same way, I looked at Esther, and I tried to do the same. I said, here's the problem. She's hurt, right? She's sick. What can I do? You know what? I can't really heal her. I can only ask God to heal her. But the only other thing I can do is get her some medicine. So I would just go get some medicine and go here. And I would just rely on the medicine to to heal her. But in doing so, I realized that I wasn't really loving her because what she needed from me wasn't for me to just get her some medicine or get some water to drink. What she wanted was to be, for me to be next to her, to feel her pain, 
you know, and either, e even to rub her head to make her feel better. I did not love her well. For me, it was all about what was easiest for me. How can I serve her in a way that was natural for me? God calls us to, be, God calls us to mutual submission. In giving up our need to be served and submitting to our spouse, do we reveal the beauty that is within them and do we experience Christ through them? So in our marriages today, can we give up our need to be served so that we can experience Christ on a daily basis? I believe that we would have far less divorces and much healthier marriages if we just got good at this one thing, submitting to one another. So the first relationship that Paul addresses in marriage, but the second, uh, second relationship that he addresses is parents and children. Right? What does it mean to submit as parents? In parenting, submission is giving up your need to be in control. Right? Giving up your need to be in control. Parents, you need to stop living through your children. Right? I have no doubt that you love your kids. I have no doubt that you want the very best for them. But do they know that? I think oftentimes parenting is more about us than it is about them. And so no matter how lofty your dreams are for your kids, what they want most, what they need most, is to know that you love them and you care for them and that you accept them. I think for many of us, we project our success onto our kids. Right? Why is it that so many children want to be lawyers, doctors, and businessmen? Right? Why not a teacher? Why not a social worker? Why not even a janitor? Right? If they're really good at cleaning things, if they have a passion for it, why not? But the reason is because I feel like those jobs aren't beneath them. Those jobs are beneath us. And so we define success not by what God's standards are, but what our standards are. We want our kids to grow up successful, rich, and well-mannered. Why? Because it reflects well on us. We want to feel accomplished. And so look at what Paul says in verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Right? In your pursuit of feeling accomplished and raising successful kids, are you exasperating your children? Right? Are you making them angry? The reason why I believe that Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children, is because in our pursuit of wanting what's best for our kids, we forget what's most important. It's for us to show them that they are loved and fully accepted no matter what. If you were to ask your children, what's important to mom or dad, what would they say? Would it be getting all A's? Getting a perfect SAT score? Would it be that they would obey your every single word? How we treat our kids says a lot about what's important to us. And anytime our kids don't feel loved and accepted, they will act out by being exasperated. Do your kids experience Jesus through the way that you love and accept them? What they don't want are rules and behaviors to be shoved down their throats. They want to know that dad will, dad and mom, mom and dad will always love them and be there to support them. They want to know that you're on their side no matter what, even if they mess up. I think we're more concerned about making disciples of ourselves than, ma than making disciples of Jesus. And that's why we're so adamant. That's why we want them to obey our every single word. But in the passage, Paul instructs children to obey parents in the Lord. Right? He's not saying be obedient blindly, but be obedient to God. Obey your parents because that's what God would want. So Paul doesn't say raise your children to be successful, wealthy, or popular. He says raise your children in the training and instruction of the Lord because what Jesus Christ wants for your child is for them to be a disciple of Jesus. We need to give up our need to control our kids and instead love them and support them no matter how many times they fail. This doesn't mean that we let them do as they please. No, you are the parents. You are to parent your child, to correct them, but to do it in love. Do you react to the circumstances or do you respond to the circumstances? There are times where you're going to blow up, your ch blow up at your children, and I understand that. Kids can be frustrating. And it just shows that you are passionate and that you care. 
But do your kids know that? Do they see your rebuke as an act of love or do they see it as an act of disappointment? Trust me, if your children know that you love them, they will be far more, they will take your instruction far more better. Right? We need to love our children not for what they do, but for who they are. Jesus loves us not because of what we do for him, but because of who he is. If Jesus loves us for who we are, for who we are and not what we do, why can't we do the same for them? We respond in obedience. If obedience is a natural expression of Jesus Christ loving us, why do we expect our kids to obey us before we love them? Your relationship with your children is a gateway for them to experience God. Right? Just like Sumi said in, the, in her testimony on screen, her view of God was shaped by her relationship with her, her, with her dad. We say that God is a good, good father. Could your kids say the same? Submission requires us to give up control in shaping our children in the way that we want and instead to give, up, to give control to God as the ultimate parent to shape our child the way that he wants. Submission is giving up control so that God can take control. Right? This is what it means to submit as a parent. Yes, children should submit to you because you are the parent. You know what's best or you, uh, you should know what's best for them. But we also, as parents, need to submit to our children. The third relationship that Paul addresses is to slaves and slave owners. Now, how does this relate to us? Right? How does slavery, how do slaves and slave owners relate to us? And I want to say it relates to us in the sense where the same power dynamic that is going, going into slavery is the same power dynamic that we see in our work relationships. And so what does it mean to submit in our work relationships? In work relationships, submission is giving up your need for power. To give up your need for power. Paul addresses the slaves and slave owners. So the third relation that Paul addresses in this, in this passage is, is slaves and slave owners. But it's not slavery as we know it. Slavery in Paul's times didn't have to do with race, didn't have to do with the exploitation of a certain type of people. People became slaves through various reasons. Right? It could have been through childbirth. It could have been through prison, being a prisoner of war. It could have been through um, not being able to pay back your debts. And some even actually chose voluntarily to go into slavery to better their condition. Yes, slaves' lives were harsh, but not all of them were. Right? A large portion of this, a large number of people in those times in Greece and Rome were slaves. And not all of them, and their condition or their, their lifestyle depended on their masters. Slaves didn't just do menial work, they did all types of work, including uh, managing and oversight. Many were educated better than their owners. Right? They could own property and even save up for their freedom. Some were loved and treated like family. While slavery in those days isn't what it is as we know it, it was still a system of injustice. And the reason why Paul is addressing it is because people were being dehumanized and devalued. Slaves had no rights. They were seen as property. And so Paul sees this system of injustice and he speaks against it. He's not condoning slavery, but he's condoning the, the very issues that make up slavery. He's saying that the reason why these injustices are still here is because people are being devalued. And that's why in verse 5 Paul says, Slaves, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves as Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as you, as you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Paul's instructions to slaves is to work hard because he's saying your work does not define you. Your value is not based on what you do. You are to work hard because that is what God is calling you to do. And God will reward your faithfulness. Right? Oftentimes it's our job and our role in culture that gives us worth. But here Paul is saying no. The only reason you are worthy, the only, the, your value should not be placed on the work that you do, but in who I am. 
And so Paul says, he goes on in verse 9 and says, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is ma both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Paul instructs slave masters to treat their slaves in the same way. And this goes beyond the golden rule of treat people the way that you would want to be treated. When he says treat them in the same way, he's referring back to what he just told slaves. In treating people with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Paul is saying treat your slaves as you would treat Jesus. If we were to treat people like we would treat Jesus, that goes above and beyond how we would want to be treated. For many of us who are, in uh, who are in positions of power, we will fight for equality because it's fair. Right? We don't mind people being at the same level as, as us. But what God calls us is to be righteous. Treating others the way we would want to be treated is equality. Treating others as, a way that, as if they were Jesus is righteousness. Right? Let me say that again. Treating others the way we would like to be treated is equality. Treating others as if they were Jesus is righteousness. So what does this have to do with our work relationships? Well, your, work relationship, your workplace exists in a power dynamic. Right? There's a term called office politics. And office politics is based on the idea that certain people have more value than others. In office politics, it matters who your friends are. It matters who you keep company with. There are certain people that you want to know because it will help you get ahead. While for some others, you don't really care for because they have nothing to offer you. Right? Think about the people that you have a relationship with in your workplace. How many of us keep company with those who have nothing to offer us? How many of us keep company based on what we have to, how we can serve them? Many of you are in positions of power and privilege, and that's amazing. But as employees, do you look and say, how can I serve them to help them succeed? Or do you say, how can I use them to accomplish my goals? God is asking us to treat people as if they were Jesus. And this means that we have to stand up for the injustices that we see today. Right? There are systems in play where certain people just don't get the same opportunities or the same pay. It has nothing to do with capability. It has everything to do with the way the system is built. For instance, women have been victims of the system for so long. They don't get the same pay or opportunities as, as men get. And this is wrong. This is an injustice. This is why at Metro we're looking to hire a female pastor and to elevate women into leadership. Because this is a justice issue. For us at Metro, we see that women have been oppressed in the church, and it's our call to act out in righteousness. The only way that we can breathe life into an area of oppression is to imitate Jesus Christ and to give up our need for power so that we can elevate others. And so as we look at this whole passage as a whole, the one thing that brings them all together is this idea of submission to one another. But if you look closely at all three different relationships, right, there's a responsibility given to actually the person who has power. When we look at marriage, it's the husbands who, have given, who are given the responsibility of loving their wives, taking it a step further to love their wives. Right? In parenting, it's the parents. Yes, children are to submit to their parents, but children are to love their parents right, and to raise them up in the way of God. And even for a slave and slave owners, the responsibility falls on the slave owners because they are in a position of power. We are called to act out in justice. We are called to be agents of righteousness. And the way we do that is by submitting to one another and seeing people as, they, as if they were Jesus. For me, I, I love being a youth pastor. Right? I love working with kids. I love that they're energetic. I love that they're passionate. I love sometimes that they're even crazy. But the one thing I hate about being a youth pastor, and I, I will say hate, is that people look at me as if I wasn't a real pastor. Right? There's this perception that youth pastors aren't in it because they love kids, but it's because they need training. 
And they have to train with some teenagers for a few years before they can be elevated to work with adults. Right? And so for me, there's a lot of times where I feel like a secondhand citizen. It's very humbling. And this is not just people in the church, it's also pastors. Right? It's, it's, it's as if youth pastors are on the bottom of the totem pole. A few years ago, I was actually at our uh, annual denominational conference. So our denomination, the ECC, we have a conference every single year. And a couple of years ago, I was at this conference where they were trying to plan and organize for this youth conference. So our denomination has a youth conference that happens every three years where everyone uh, that's part of the ECC comes together. Uh, all the teenagers come together for this conference. And so they're trying to plan out this conference. And the people, the higher ups, they go to Pastor Peter and is like, Pastor Peter, we would love for you to be part of this meeting. Can you help us organize this conference? And so they were looking for multi-ethnic uh, church pastors. And so, but instead he was like, you know what? Like, I don't think I'm the right person for it. You should actually, you should have my uh, youth pastor go. So he's like, you know, talk to Clay. Have Clay go to that meeting. And so I go to that meeting and I look around and everyone's introducing themselves. And not a single youth pastor was in the room. It was all lead pastors or executive pastors of multi-ethnic churches trying to plan out a youth conference. And for me, it was really humbling. Yes, I was excited because I was there, but it was really humbling that these higher-ups would only go to the people that they valued. And so that's why I'm so appreciative of Pastor Peter, because what Pastor Peter did was to give up his power in order to elevate me. I wouldn't have a voice at that meeting unless Pastor Peter said, you know what, I'm not the person for this. I have no youth experience. But my youth pastor, he's the one you're supposed to talk to. He's the one you should talk to. For us, we need to look at people not for what they do, but we need to value them for who Jesus is. We need to act out in righteousness. We need to be agents of justice. And the way we do that is by submitting. It requires us to give up our need to be served, to give up our need to be in control, and to give up our need for power. Submission is an act of justice where we choose to value people based upon who Jesus Christ is. It's to look at our brother and sister in the eye and see Christ. So who is God asking you to submit to today? Would you pray with me?